In this video, I'm going to show you how to build your very own Herm system and some pitfalls to avoid while building it. And that's coming up next. Welcome to Short Circuit of Brewers. Our channel is all about electric brewing. We do electric brew days, product reviews, and how-to instructional videos just like this one. In this video, I'm going to review with you the products you need for your Herms build, as well as some of the pitfalls that I encountered in building my very own system and some of the things you can avoid to make your system come out as optimal as it can be with as few problems and as trouble-free operation as possible. Comment down in the comment section below. Let us know what type of system you're looking at building. If you've been watching this series, you're probably looking at doing some sort of an electric brewing system. Let us know what you're looking at doing and let us know how far you are along the build. You know, give us some idea of what's going on in your system and what you're looking at. So we appreciate it. Also, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing for more content. Give us a thumbs up. We really appreciate it. It lets us know that we're bringing good content to you and that's really what we want to do. So now in case you're new to the channel, or new to the video series, just quickly review what a Herm system is. So a Herm system is a heat exchanging, recirculating mash system. So what that is, you've got a boil kettle, you've got a mash tun, and then you've also got a hot liquor tank which houses a recirculation coil. Generally stainless steel could be copper, but the, that is a three vessel Herm system, and those are the three vessels involved in that system. Now let's take a look at what you're gonna need to build the system. You're gonna need a boil kettle, and one of the things that I want to talk about with the boil kettle is the relation of the diameter of the kettle to the height of the kettle. I went the cheap route initially and bought a 15 gallon kettle on Amazon that was very cheap. I don't even think they sell them on Amazon anymore, but it was a very wide kettle. I think it was about 18 inches in diameter and about the same height. Now that might not seem like too much of a problem, but here's the issue with that. When you have a kettle that is about a one-to-one -one ratio, you're going to have less distance between the gallon gradations. So what I mean is that when you fill it with a gallon of water, the distance from a gallon of water to two gallons of water is very shallow. So what happens is when you go to boil, you're going to experience an issue if your batch, let's say because of boil off, my batches were about 13 gallons. And because the ratio on the size of the kettle was so small or it was the same, the wort was about three or four inches from the top. Not so much of an issue with an electric system because we can cycle the elements on and off, but it is still a little bit of a pain because you are dealing with the possibility of a boil over initially in that first, you know, for when it first comes up to boil temperature. So that is one thing that I would tell you. I did switch to a 20 gallon kettle since then. It is not a, it's still pretty close to a one-to-one -one ratio, but it's a little bit taller than it is wide and it is 20 gallons. So now I'd have more headspace to be able to do that. But that was one of the pitfalls that I experienced early on in my system and getting that 15 gallon. Now moving on to the components of the boil kettle, you're gonna need a dip tube and a bulkhead if you purchase a kettle that doesn't have one already. I did go with a part from Bobby. It is a 5 8 dip tube. And what is special about that is the inside diameter of it is exactly half inch. So there's no restriction from the boil kettle to hoses or whatever that have a half inch ID. So you've also got the element and enclosure. When I was building my system, it was some years ago and we did not have all of the items that we do nowadays. I went with the system that is known from the electric brewery with the conduit junction box housing and the cover and the washer and the o-ring and all that and i can show some of that to you in the video right here one thing i'll tell you it is somewhat tool intensive because of the fact you have to drill a hole in the center of that conduit box that is large enough to allow you to put the element in and be able to secure it while you turn the nut down so we have much better equipment options for us now one of those is the enclosure from brew hardware and a quick note about that i just wanted to let you guys also know that I have been doing this series and I reached out to Bobby from Brew Hardware and uh, kind of told him what I was doing and he's very busy but he did respond back to me and he let me know that he is going to give us an affiliate marketing deal with them. These videos have been helping quite a few of you and I've been sending quite a bit of business to his business quite frankly. 
So he said that he would be kind enough to hook us up with that. So as of this video, I don't have all of the details in place for it yet, but very soon the links in this video will be an affiliate link for us to be able to get a little bit of money. If you use the links, you know, we certainly appreciate it. It'll help us bring more content to you, help a small business. And I mean, I think that's what America's all about. So, so moving on to the next component that you're going to need for the boil kettle, you're going to need a sight glass. I used a weldless option from Brew Hardware. There are some more options available from them now than were available whenever I first started building my system. I do like the new hose sight glass that they have because it is flexible and it will allow you to bump up against it without worrying about damaging it. None of the sight glasses that they offer come with any kind of a shielding, which, you know, not a deal breaker, but I do like that and I may up upgrade to that at some point in the future. The other optional item on my system is I have a Whirlpool port and all you need to do to do that is just put a bulkhead with a short elbow, a ball valve, and a cam lock fitting. Then you can do whirlpools in your kettle. Mine works very well. One of the things that I did do, I don't do very five gallon batches very often, but one of the things that I did do was I put it down low enough that should I want to do a five gallon batch and do a whirlpool in that, I can. So I mean, I have it at between the three and four gallon mark. And just so you know, all of these principles that are being used in the boil kettle can be used in a kegel. It can be used in whatever type of kettle you want. Moving on to the next piece of equipment, you're looking at a mash tun. Now what this is where you put the grains, you mash the grains, you need a false bottom in it. I personally went with a Blickman boiler maker at the time that I was building my system because there weren't a lot of options that I had available uh, that I liked. Uh, I'd gone with a, I had a cooler before that, an igloo cooler with a false bottom in it. It was okay, but I definitely wanted to step up to something stainless steel so that you know I needed to drill a hole in it for the return, etc. So that was what I went with at that time. Now there's a ton of different options available to us now. Uh, insulated mash tons, there's ones that are insulated with a heating pad on the bottom to help maintain temperature. There's just so many different options. So you just choose whatever is right for you. Just understand that you will have to drill a hole in it, generally either in the, in the lid or in the side of the kettle or igloo cooler or whatever it is in order to have your return. Now for the return, you'll need a bulkhead with an elbow. I use a short piece of silicone hose on mine to lay inside of the mash tun so that I can recirculate the wort. On the outside, you'll need a cam lock fitting or you may want to put a ball valve on there. One note on the ball valve issue on the outside, if you don't put one on there, you do want to make sure that whenever you stop recirculating and you go to do anything else, you want to make sure that you pull the hose up out of the work because it will siphon back out. So that's one of the things that uh, can happen to you if you're not careful. So just be aware of that. You know, if you have everything hooked up, you can turn off the valves on your Herms coil. But the other item you'll need for the mash tun is going to be a T somewhere in the system. And that will be for the probe from the control panel to monitor the temperature of it while you're recirculating your mash. Moving on to the HLT or the hot liquor tank, that is what's going to house your stainless steel coil. Now, just a quick word about that. I did go with two of the King Cooker, just the cheapest kettles that I could get on Amazon. I was trying to build it on a budget, but it was pretty problematic with my hot liquor tank. Not so much with the boil kettle, but the hot liquor tank was problematic. There was a couple reasons why. The first reason is that the bulkhead for the dip tube inside was very flexible. I mean, the, it had very thin walls on the kettle. I still have the kettle and you know, it's, it's just a little bit of a pain. If you have a hose hanging off of there, it will kick the dip tube up and leave, you know, quite a bit of water in the bottom if you're not careful. So that is one thing to note there. The second thing is that the coil hangs off of the side of the kettle in a Herm system. So if the walls are thin on your kettle, you're going to have an issue where it's going to be pushing on the bottom and pulling on the top. And that is just a recipe for leaks. I know in my system, I put it together, I didn't realize it, did the first wet test, got everything going, got water inside of the coil. It was already kind of sagging a little bit, but I didn't think it was gonna be an issue, but got everything together, started doing the wet test. Sure enough, I had water running out of both of the bulkheads. So just bear in mind, if you do get a thin wall kettle, you're gonna need something to prop up the coil. Now that brings me to one of the things that is probably the cheapest thing that I've done in my system and maybe one of the things that I'm the most proud of. The kettle, the coil was sagging. I couldn't, I, I was trying to figure out some way to get it to be propped up. And so I went to a restaurant equippers store and was looking, looking, trying to figure out something for it. And I found a one ounce ladle. 
that was stainless steel, cut the handle off at the right size, and then it had a curve at the top for like hanging it on a pot or whatever. So I took that curve and I put another curve in it so that it basically created a, a cradle for the Herms coil to sit in. So, and it's, and it's in my kettle. I'll show you some footage of it, but I'm probably, you know, that was the most ingenious thing that I did with the whole system, I would imagine. But uh, so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So where there's a will, there's a way it works very well. I mean, it holds the coil in the right spot and doesn't leak. So, but just a little bit of advice there with that portion of it. So the other components for your hot liquor tank are obviously going to be the coil, the bulkheads, the dip tube and bulkhead for that. You'll also want to have, I have a T in my system off of the bulkhead for the probe to go in to monitor the temperature. My system monitors the temperature as it flows through the outlet in the pump and then back to the top. So you'll also need a elbow hose, some type of inlet into the top of that hot liquor tank. And the reason why you want to recirculate everything in there is because you can have some water temperature differences. If you don't recirculate, it's highly recommended that you recirculate so you don't have hot spots where the coil is sitting in hotter water at the bottom than it is at the top. So you do need to do that. You'll also need a couple of pumps for the Herm system. And I'm going to recommend again, the ones, you know, Brew Hardware has several different options for that. March, Chugger, I think, and they have a couple others. Um, also, they have a hose kit, which, you know, I highly recommend that. Again, like I said, it's, it's so easy to buy the hose kit, you're done, everything is good. They have the valves, the cam lock fittings, everything there. So they, they put a package together for you that's very nice on that. So on the outside of your bulkheads for your Herms coil, you're gonna need a couple of ball valves for that and some cam locks for that. That's pretty much about the size of all the equipment that you're gonna need for a Herms system. I'm breaking this up into two parts because of the fact that there's so much equipment and so many details involved in doing the equipment and then also doing the control panel. Doug is working on a diagram for me right now and I'm gonna kind of fashion it after my system. There's a few things in my system that I probably would do differently now. And so we're gonna to try to bring that to you with an updated diagram on exactly what my system is. I try to do a bare bones as, as I could, you know, no flashing buzzers, no voltage meters, no amp meters, anything like that. I, I was trying to build it on a budget and I think it worked out pretty well. I mean, I brewed a lot of different beers on it, a lot of batches of beers on it. In closing, Thank you guys so much for supporting our channel, all the feedback and everything we've received recently. Leave us a comment below about where you are with your system. Subscribe for more content. Give us a thumbs up. We really appreciate it. If you don't mind using the affiliate links whenever you purchase your stuff from Brew Hardware, it gives us a little bit of money in our tip jar. We want to bring more content to you. All that stuff kind of costs money, so I'd love to do a wiring video in the future, but I, you know, I've got to buy a box. I've got to buy you know, PIDs, SSRs, all that stuff. And so I, I want to bring that stuff to you, but that requires money to do that. So anything you guys do to help us, we certainly appreciate it. This has been Brian for Short Circuit of Brewers. We'll see you on the next one.